and past president of the Northern California um, Psychiatric Society. She is also the founder of Women's Wellness Psychiatry, a reproductive and integrative psychiatry clinic that is serving patients across California. And she also um, developed the online fellowship in reproductive and integrated psychiatry and um, has been running and uh, the Bay Area Perinatal Mental Health Conference now in its seventh year. She enjoys mentoring and consulting physicians and clinicians who are starting out in private practice and has even written a guidebook on the topic. Um, she is a speaker at various local and regional and national events. Um, and you can find more information about her at www.annaglazermd.com. And without further ado, um, welcome Dr. Glazer, and we're looking forward to your talk. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really uh, excited about this, and I really enjoy talking about integrative treatment options for women's mental health. And in this case, we're going to talk specifically about perinatal mental health. So thank you, everyone, for having me here today. And let's just kind of jump right into things. I'm happy to leave plenty of time for questions at the end. So here we go. So just one note on disclosures. I don't have any financial association with any public or private companies for that matter, um, but I do run the uh, as disclosure fellowship for reproductive and integrative psychiatry, which is psychiatryfellowship.com. And some of the content that I'm going to be presenting today actually comes from the content in that fellowship program. So where I want to start is actually to define integrative psychiatry and to make a note to separate that out from integrated. There's sometimes confusion between integrative and integrated, and I just want to clarify that confusion. Integrated mental health treatment is often mental health treatment that is embedded in another service. So for example, in primary care or oncology or cardiology or wherever it might be, um, in that case, it is integrated into and embedded into that treatment of whatever subspecialty it might be. Integrative psychiatry is what we're going to be talking about today. And basically it's the merging of Western treatment options, particularly the traditional psychopharmacology that we're so familiar with, with Eastern complementary and holistic treatment options. And it's really a way, the way, the way that I think about it is that it's a way of assessing and treating patients that really looks at a number of different pillars. So for my own ability to kind of separate things out, I like to think about it in several different pillars, and that's what I'm going to be talking about today. The, the biological, which really looks at things like pharmacology, botanicals, nutraceuticals, hormones, genetics, and various kinds of in utero exposures. The psychological and spiritual, that include things like mindfulness and psychotherapy. Certain lifestyle factors, so that includes nutritional psychiatry, which is definitely a growing and emerging field exercise science, complementary treatment options, acupuncture is a really common one in Chinese medicine, for example, and ecotherapy, as well as the role of support systems. And that's not something to be neglected. I think the role of support systems in our patients' mental, uh, mental health care is paramount. So the reason that I want to talk about integrative mental health is because it's so prevalent. And one of the reasons that I actually got into it myself was because many of my patients were coming in using various kinds of treatment modalities that were outside of kind of the traditional Western medicine approach. So a lot of patients were using various supplements or acupuncture or massage. And the data really shows that so many of our patients are actually using these kinds of treatments. So about 38% of adults in the U.S. 18 plus have used some sort of complementary and alternative medicine, according to the NHIS survey. And this was actually decades ago. Those numbers are higher at this point. And CAM use was higher actually among women compared to men in that particular survey. And my practice, which is uh, women's wellness psychiatry, focuses on reproductive psychiatry and the, the primary patients are usually in my practice about ages 25 to 65. So going through various reproductive stages, it could be um, premenstrual symptoms, it could be challenging fertility journeys, pregnancy, postpartum, perimenopause, really all different kinds of hormonal changes. And so using integrative treatments to manage those kinds of life stages. So the reason 
I started to work in integrative mental health is because so many of my patients were asking me questions about how to complement some of their regular traditional psychopharmacology treatments with some of these additional kinds of options. And so I really began to kind of learn more about it. And that was where I went into, um, I completed a, an integrative psychiatry fellowship program and began kind of learning more about it and decided to put together the, the fellowship program that I now run because it combines the reproductive and the integrative piece. So what I wanna do is actually use a, an illustrative case example to show how we would approach a patient from this mindset of using integrative psychiatry. So this is a pretty typical patient that I see in my practice. Let's just say she's a 35 year old woman, she's postpartum, and she really presents with anxiety as her chief complaint. She's someone who has a history of anxiety in college, some mild depression around some stressful life events. She reports some difficulty with sleep, Breastfeeding is also a challenge, and her primary concern, her chief complaint, the way she describes it, is a feeling of overwhelm, and that's probably the number one most common word that I hear in my practice. So when we think about this particular patient, we really think about, you know, what are all of the different root causes of her anxiety, and then we're going to think about an integrative treatment plan to address all of those root causes. So in this particular patient, she has the precipitous hormonal drop that happens at delivery. So you have at the tail end of pre pregnancy, pretty significant rise in progesterone and estrogen levels. And then at delivery, that's a pretty precipitous fall in both of those hormones. And it takes three to six months for pregnancy related hormones to return to pre-pregnancy -pre levels. And so during that window of time, of readjustment, there can definitely be anxiety and mood symptoms. So hormonal is number one. Genetic, so this particular patient has a mother with some history of anxiety. There's the component of sleep deprivation when you're taking care of a neonate, a newborn, there's significant sleep deprivation and sleep interruption. In this particular patient, there was some support system insufficiency. And I think support systems, again, I wanna emphasize that, are really key. I think with patients who are postpartum, we also focus quite a bit on nutrition. What happens quite a bit with postpartum moms, right, is you know they're they're maybe using whatever food is available. They're not necessarily having the time, energy, or ability to prepare nutritious food. So it's often forgetting to eat or eating when you you know you're way past hungry, um, and not necessarily eating nutritious food, but eating convenient food. So thinking about quantity, quality, and frequency getting a sense of you know, how much time is this patient able to actually get outside. Uh, it can be really hard to make it outside, especially with a newborn. Is there any time for physical activity and how to make time for that? And then certain kinds of psychological predispositions. These are some of the most common ones that I hear with a lot of my postpartum moms are you know, guilt and self-blame as a mother, particularly, you know, we mentioned that this patient is having challenges with breastfeeding that can lead to a lot of sense of value as a mother, as a caregiver, uh, as a woman. And so a lot of guilt and self-blame issues come up, issues related to self-worth and perfectionism come up quite a bit as well. So thinking about these various biological, psychological support system and other factors that are root causes of this patient's anxiety and using that to compile a comprehensive integrative treatment plan. And this is just an example of what I might use with, with this particular patient. And what I'll do in a moment is go into some details about the, the treatment options that I tend to turn to quite frequently. So for this particular patient, it might be appropriate to start her on a low dose of an anti-anxiety medication, including having a comprehensive and thorough discussion about the risks and benefits of medication versus no medication and the reproductive safety during lactation, thinking about a number of potentially botanical options that can promote sleep and help manage anxiety, thinking about a hormonal component and whether or not the patient, for example, is taking any contraceptives postpartum, and if those are hormonal contraceptives, the impact of that, thinking about her family history and what helped this patient's mother's anxiety, thinking about psychological approaches, CBT for anxiety to target some of the negative thoughts, um, potentially an MBSR class. There's some really good data on MBCT specifically for perinatal and postpartum populations. 
thinking about nutrition. So for this particular patient, looking at the role of protein for energy balance and avoiding some of the roller coasters associated with sugar and processed foods, ecotherapy, there's some really good data on that, sunlight for vitamin D, and then the support systems piece. I'm gonna keep emphasizing these thinking about you know, creating that village postpartum in terms of asking for help. And a really practical solution is also potentially asking a lactation consultant for help with some of the breastfeeding challenges. So this is what I mean by integrative psychiatry is that we're not just looking at one specific treatment option. We're looking at this really, this entire constellation of different treatments to treat all of the different constellation of root causes for this particular patient's anxiety. So let's look a little bit more in depth. As I mentioned, what I like to do in, for myself is to organize things into frameworks. And so the framework that I've been using in the fellowship that I teach and that I want to share with you is this idea of several modules that's, that split up the number of different treatment options. I do like to focus on kind of treatment focused approaches because I really think that it's important to be practical. I want this information to be practical for you so you can kind of apply it. And so separating things out into different buckets of treatment options, I find is one convenient way of separating out this information. So the modules that I'm going to be speaking about are nutraceuticals and botanicals, interventions and devices, nutrition, support systems, and then how to integrate with traditional treatments. And what I'll do is I'm actually gonna share an example from each of those different modules. What I'm not going to talk about is more traditional reproductive psychopharmacology as that's something that is discussed in various other settings and something that I've, I've discussed um, in various settings as well. So let's take a look at one specific nutraceutical that I wanna talk about now. And I wanna start by talking about magnesium. This is one that I actually spend a, a lot of time talking with various of my patients about. I don't know the exact numbers, but if I had to guess, it's probably upwards of 75% of my patients are actually taking some type of magnesium for various kinds of conditions. And so we're gonna talk about the role of treating perinatal anxiety and insomnia using magnesium, go over some of the benefits, the current literature. We'll talk about some of the different formulations as there's more than half a dozen different kinds. And I'll talk about a particular case example. So before we dive into specifically magnesium, I do want to just mention when making recommendations around botanicals and supplements, there can be um, a lot of challenges with finding the appropriate brand. And the way that I do that is I actually want to make sure that the brand an individual is selecting has either an NSF or USP certification. These are third-party organizations that verify the, the quality of the substance, or you can also check in consumer lab reports. Um, I, I have a subscription to that as well, because it's really important to verify that the amount of the substance that is noted in the ingredients is actually the amount that is in the bottle, because there can sometimes be discrepancies. So really just making sure that it's a quality brand that's made preferably either in the US or Canada um, and has the, the certification. And those are things that I, I talk with a lot of my patients about just to make sure that it's something that is, um, you know, just like medication, you know, it's something that's verified. It's something that you can count on the dose being accurate and appropriate and consistent over time. So magnesium, what is it? It's an element that's really essential for cellular function. And there does tend to be a nutritional deficiency in many Western diets. Part of the reason is a lot, even if you're purchasing kind of high quality food that's organic, it really depends on the soil in which that food is grown. And oftentimes in Western settings, we, we do actually have quite a bit of depletion in our soil at this point. But if you're really focusing on some of the dietary sources of magnesium, you're going to be looking at things like fish, uh, certain seeds, apples, legumes, and dark leafy greens. And there's a lot of known benefits for magnesium. So there is a number of benefits in the neurology literature for managing headaches and migraine prophylaxis. There's also data on muscle recovery and on helping with restless legs. And this is actually something that significantly increases in pregnancy. So that's another reason why magnesium can be helpful in pregnancy. And then there's a number of psychiatric 
reasons for using magnesium. So that includes anxiety, insomnia, and PMS, and that's what we're going to be talking about. Again, reviewing the literature on these conditions. One of the things just to keep in mind is that the literature on nutraceuticals and supplements often tends to be not necessarily as robust as we would want, especially compared to some of the data that we have out there on psychotropic medications. Part of that is oftentimes there's less money devoted to this type of research. We don't have a whole bunch of large pools of money from pharma companies, et cetera, to, to do some of this research, but there is more and more being devoted to this. And so here's the data that we have. So there's an interesting 2017 systematic review in nutrients that took a look at 18 different studies with a really wide dose range of magnesium. And that's something I'm gonna mention in a minute. It compared, there was some of the studies that actually compared it to buspirone and found it to be equivalent. And they, they really concluded that the existing evidence is suggestive of a beneficial effect of magnesium on anxiety in those who are vulnerable to anxiety. There's a few hypothesized mechanisms by which magnesium works. So number one, it actually decreases neuronal hyperexcitability because it inhibits NMDA receptor mm -hmm. activity. It's essential for several G-coupled okay. protein receptors in the, in the brain that are involved in glutamate, and then it increases GABAergic yeah. availability. But again, the issue here is that some of the, a lot of the stu sub studies in this systematic review were not described as high quality studies, mm -hmm. but there is some data for anxiety. There's also data for PMS symptoms. And again, as a reproductive psychiatrist, I treat a lot of PMS and PMDD. There was a study that really looked at, uh, it was a systematic review of seven studies that looked at a combination of randomized control and cross-sectional studies, the use of magnesium over the course of several cycles, and about half of them showed some improvement in symptoms, and then it was most helpful when combined with B6. For a, so for a lot of my individuals who are struggling with PMDD, I actually think about recommending supplemental magnesium combined with B6 and then other PMDD recommendations as well. And there is also some data for magnesium in mood. And for mood, it's actually been studied a little bit less outside, a little bit more outside of the perinatal population. And there was an interesting study that those with hypomagnesemia and depression had improved symptoms when they were administered magnesium, and they measured the depression based on the BDI scores. And I think it's important to also think about, you know, do you want to obtain uh, a magnesium lab level versus empirically supplement? For a lot of my patients, whether we're talking about um, magnesium or sometimes vitamin D or several other vitamin or mineral deficiencies, I often engage in empirical supplementation with the assumption that many individuals tend to have at least mild to moderate deficiencies in a number of these vitamins and minerals. And the, the benefits, if we notice benefits from taking these supplements, we don't necessarily need to go through the additional cost and burden of getting repeat lab draws. Although for some individuals, it can be a really useful tool. Magnesium has also been studied for sleep. And again, in this case, magnesium is an NMDA um, antagonist and plays a role in sleep. And so there's this 2012 study, again, really small studies, generally speaking, 46 individuals, they were supplemented with magnesium and there was an improvement across the board from diff diff various um, sleep types of components, sleep time, sleep efficiency, sleep latency. There's a decrease in cortisol with an increase in melatonin, which is the direction that you want things to be going overnight and reduced early morning awakening as well. So. Magnesium has been studied for a lot of different conditions from a mental health perspective, and it has reproductive safety. So it's see, reproductive safety has been extrapolated, number one, from its use with magnesium sulfate. So that's something that's used quite a bit in pregnancy. Um, it's also currently used quite a bit in pregnancy in the context of treating headaches and restless legs. And then there was a Cochrane review, and this one was actually interesting we get the answer a little bit backwards by looking at this study. So this was uh, a review that looked at 10 randomized controls and they really looked to see whether taking magnesium would, call, would lead to an improvement in perinatal mortality and if it would improve. And so they found that it actually 
didn't change things, but what that means was that there was no detriment to taking magnesium. So we can infer that it has reproductive safety. A lot of different types of magnesium. I tend to recommend magnesium glyconate because that's the one that's been studied to have the best impact and improvement on sleep quality. The most common one that you'll see on the shelves is usually mag oxide. That tends to be slightly less absorbed orally. Um, and then oftentimes in pregnancy, I recommend mag citrate because it does have an improvement on constipation and pregnancy can actually significantly increase constipation. So different types of magnesium, depending on what your target is. And one case example that I want to share with you is this use of magnesium that I had with one of my patients, where we used it for sleep disturbance in the context of a benzodiazepine taper. And so for many of our patients, we're trying to potentially taper them off of benzodiazepines so that because they're not a great long-term solution. And so this particular individual, she'd had a challenging fertility journey. She'd started on a couple of different benzos and she actually tried to discontinue the, the medication quite rapidly and had significant withdrawal and led to the termination of a desired pregnancy. Well, what we did was we actually used magnesium for this particular patient and we increased the dose of magnesium with every decrease in the, um, in the benzodiazepine and that actually helped her quite a bit. She would notice a disturbance of sleep, we would increase the magnesium and she was able to successfully over the course of about eight months or so taper off of all of the benzodiazepines using the magnesium in that way. So it's just a, one success story of using magnesium. So moving from nutraceuticals to interventions and devices, I do wanna talk about light boxes. Again, I'm just, I'm choosing a selection from each of the modules from each of the categories. And in this case, I wanna talk about light boxes. So we'll talk about the data on light boxes and the treatment of depression. It's used in perinatal and postpartum populations, um, some potential side effects to consider and some um, dosing and instructions as well. So what are light boxes? So they were actually first described in the 80s for the treatment of seasonal affective disorder. And the exact mechanism is unclear. It's, it's probably a combination of correcting some circadian rhythm disturbances, as well as increasing synaptic serotonin. But there was this really interesting study that noted that the therapeutic effects does require retinal pathways because they tried it shining the light on the, you know, the face and eyes, as well as the control group was putting the light on the knees. There was no benefit to shining the bright light on knees. So it was, it has to do with the retinal pathways. And so it's used primarily in seasonal affective disorder, but it's actually been studied quite a bit more often on other forms of mood disorders. So there's the meta-analysis that was sponsored by the APA and demonstrated that bright light therapy was effective for non-seasonal depression as well, and for augmentation of antidepressants. And so it's been studied with venlafaxine and fluoxetine as an augmentation agent. And then it's been studied in perinatal depression specifically. So there was a small, again, small study, randomized control trial uh, several years ago, 2008, that looked at pregnant patients over the course of five weeks. And they found that there was improved scores on depression scales comparing bright light therapy with dim red light. And there's been actually several studies confirming that since then. This is basically a description of some of the initial parameters for bright light therapy. And I think it's important to, to note that my recommendation tends to be 10,000 lux for up to 30 minutes. We start out at 10 minutes, we go up from there. There is some data on alternative treatments with a lower lux. I tend to recommend the 10,000 lux. And it's the, the position of the lamp really just depends also on the lamp itself. And so if you purchase from a reputable company, it should actually say because of the shape of the lamp and the, the size, how far away the individual should be. But it's generally about 30 degrees and usually a couple of feet um, in the morning times. And I think it's important to think about that there are potentially a few side effects. This is what I wanted to mention. The most common things are some eye strain or headache, but you also do want to be really careful with individuals who have uh, bipolar diathesis potentially, because just like certain kinds of psychopharmacological interventions, you wanna make sure that you don't trigger a hypomania or mania.
So which one? Again, I turn to consumer lab reports when making these kinds of recommendations. There's multiple different price points. It really just depends on which a patient finds most available to them um, based on price points and other things. And so these are three that have been recommended and vetted by consumer lab. And so just to share a case example of using bright light therapy, I actually had an interesting preconception patient who had multiple episodes of depression with some seasonal pattern to it. And she was interested in tapering off of her medication for the purposes of pregnancy. And what we used was a bright light therapy, keeping in mind this pattern that she had and use that along with several other interventions to really make sure that she was getting enough support and treatment so that she could effectively taper off of her medications for the purposes of pregnancy. I also want to talk a little bit about this next module, which is nutrition and specifically nutrition for reducing certain kinds of premenstrual symptoms. Again, this is just one example of the use of nutritional medicine and nutritional psychiatry, which is a really, really broad topic and includes a number of different things. When you're talking about nutritional psychiatry, you could be talking about certain dietary interventions like the Mediterranean diet, which is what we're going to talk about here. We, it could also include various kinds of supplements and botanicals because we do often get those from food as well as a number of other conditions like the micro, uh, thinking about the microbiome and disturbances in the microbiome. So nutritional psychiatry is a giant topic, which we're not going to cover all of in, in this, uh, this portion of the lecture, but specifically I wanna talk about using nutritional interventions, particularly the Mediterranean diet for treating conditions of PMS and PMDD. I know I'm talking a little bit fast. I just wanna make sure that we get a chance to cover everything and still leave some time open for questions and comments. So just to review the differences between premenstrual syndrome and PMDD. So premenstrual syndrome is a condition that can onset within about two weeks prior to menses and offsets with the onset of menses. It affects anywhere from 30 to 80% of women and a small fraction of those have clinically significant symptoms, which you can just divide into three primary categories, physical symptoms, psychological symptoms, and behavioral symptoms. So the psychological symptoms that we often see could be things like anger, anxiety, depression, irritability, physical symptoms, including things like headache, fatigue and lethargy, sleep challenges, bloating, and then behavioral symptoms like forgetfulness, fatigue, and poor concentration. PMDD is a more severe form with some significant mood disturbance, irritability, and reactivity, and it really has some significant functional impairment on quality of life for these patients. It affects three to 5% of women, and usually symptoms emerge in the 20s, and there's an increased risk if there's already a history of a mood disorder or a family history. Again, very similar symptoms, but it's a much more severe form to the point where I actually get a number of women who describe PMDD with symptoms of suicidal ideation in the context of that luteal window. So thinking about PMS and diet, I think is really interesting. And there's been a little bit of data on this. There was a cross-sectional study of the Mediterranean diet in several hundred women using a diet adherence questionnaire, and they found that symptoms of PMS improved with more adherence to this Mediterranean diet. There was another cross-sectional study of diet and PMS symptoms in students, and they noticed increased physical symptoms with those who had stepped away from a Mediterranean diet, so they were consuming more fat and processed sugar content, and they actually had lower behavioral symptoms, so the behavioral symptoms of PMS with increased fruit consumption, and then soy isoflavones also reduced some physical symptoms. And so I think it's important to also just recognize what is the Mediterranean diet. So this is something that was first defined by Ansel Keys, and it was defined as a diet that's low in saturated fat and high in vegetable oils. So how do you achieve a Mediterranean diet? And this is actually the diet that's been studied the most in nutritional psychiatry and in the literature for managing mood conditions like depression. There's a pretty good amount of data on that. 
but it involves increasing vegetables, nuts, and healthy oils, increasing fruits, minimizing red meats and processed foods, and increasing fish. So really avoiding things like baked goods or things that come in boxes and looking towards the, the produce section of the grocery store. The challenge, of course, with using dietary changes to influence mood is that it's oftentimes more challenging, both in terms of access and time intensity and adherence compared to certain other kinds of treatments, but it can be really, really valuable to look at food as medicine. And so what is the mechanism? A few hypothesized mechanisms, including reduction of inflammation and reducing cytokines, a decrease in oxidative stress, and better management of hormones like insulin and some of the related endocrine pathways as well. And so one way that I've used it actually was, this is a case example of a young woman who had premenstrual exacerbation and just to define that, the difference between PMDD and PME is that with PME, there's another underlying coexisting condition, for example, major depressive disorder, and it gets worse as it gets exacerbated during that luteal phase. So this particular young woman had PME along with some weight challenges, some mood fluctuations, and she was really interested in a non-pharmacological approach to treating her symptoms. And so we actually had her transition to a Mediterranean style diet, and she did notice an improvement in her symptoms, not just actually of the premenstrual symptoms, but overall in mood as well. The next thing I wanna talk about is support systems. And in this case, what I wanna focus on is the five-step postpartum plan. So basically a discussion that I have with all of my patients, at least in their third trimester, if not sooner, in preparation for postpartum. And this is a really important part of the support system planning, along with many other factors. So what I talk about are the support that an individual patient has, so for example, who's going to be assisting with the neonate, with the infant once the, the patient is home from the hospital, thinking about the role of sleep. So sleep disturbance is really common, of course, but thinking about how to protect sleep, thinking about the fact that nighttime sleep is more restorative than daytime sleep. And there's something almost magical about that four and a half, five hour mark. So thinking about chunking sleep and what needs to be done to do that, especially for any patients who have additional vulnerabilities, such as a prior diagnosis of bipolar disorder. So thinking about the role of sleep, thinking about the role of nutrition, like we talked about, the, what often happens postpartum is that a lot of women are focused so much on baby that there's not enough time for them to focus on feeding themselves. So thinking about the role of nutrition, Thinking about the role of pain management, you know, what do they have planned for pain management during delivery, but also postpartum, because there is some interesting data that poor pain management in the context of a challenging labor and delivery experience can increase the risk of postpartum depression. And then also thinking about breastfeeding. What are their plans for breastfeeding? What are their plans if there's a challenge or an issue with breastfeeding? You know, making sure that if you are using a lactation consultant, that it's someone who is mental health aware um, rather than uh, dogmatic about the recommendations about breastfeeding and thinking about you know, what kind of support is going to be necessary for you to reach your breastfeeding goals. So this is the, the five-step postpartum plan that I use with my patients. And then finally, the last module I just want to touch on um, and then I want to make sure that I have at least 15 minutes for questions, is integrating with traditional treatments. So thinking about, in this case, what I want to talk about is the role of hormonal medications and postpartum mental health. So using this case example, we have a first-time mom, she's postpartum, and she's experiencing some mild symptoms of depression. She's hesitant to consider antidepressant medication, and this is something I hear quite a bit in my clinic. She's already in therapy, and she's asking about starting the mini pill for contraception. So the mini pill is a progesterone-only pill versus a hormonal IUD. So the, the IUD, the hormonal IUDs, there's several of them, and they all have low doses of progesterone that is released locally. With notable history of worsening mood in the past on certain types of birth control. 
So there's some interesting data on postpartum progesterone and mood. This is something that I'm asked quite a bit is, is there something wrong with my hormones? Do they need to be rebalanced? Should I be taking hormones postpartum to rebalance my hormones? Like we talked about, it can take three to six months for postpartum hormones to get back to pre-pregnancy levels. So there was an interesting review of a couple hundred women where they received a dose of progesterone 48 hours postpartum. And interestingly, it went against their original hypothesis because what happened was that it increased the risk of postpartum depression at six weeks, though that risk was attenuated by the end of the fourth trimester. That's what we often refer to as the first three months postpartum is the fourth trimester. And so what they concluded was a single dose of synthetic progesterone does not decrease the postpartum depression risk. And so this is really interesting because the theory is that because of the precipitous drop in hormones, particularly progesterone, um, that that's the reason for some of the symptoms of postpartum depression. It's the corpus luteum who that secretes progesterone, but a lot of women postpartum, it takes a number of months to start ovulating again and to have a corpus luteum that's going to be secreting that progesterone. And so there's this missing progesterone postpartum, and that's thought to be a mechanism for postpartum depression. However, supplementing it through this kind of synthetic in, in, injection was not actually effective at preventing that particular outcome. So I thought that was a really interesting study. There is you know, more and more data coming out on brexanolone, which is alloprogninolone, a, a neurosteroid that modulates GABA-A. And so that's something that has been shown to be really helpful for postpartum depression. There was an interesting 2018 review of a number of contraceptive options, and it looked uh, reviewed 26 different articles, and they found no association with depression, but overall the studies are of pretty poor quality. There is some data on the relationship between depo and depression, but there's this issue of discontinuation bias. And then there was a, a, an article that came out that got a lot of press in JAMA Psychiatry that came out a few years back. And basically, I guess at this point is 2016, more than just a few years at this point. And it what it showed was that particularly in adolescents, the use of hormones actually increased the risk of depression later on. All of these are associations and you know we, we need to figure out how are we going to utilize this data with our individual patients. So what I what I like to think about is the fact that you know if, even if you do have some of these large associations, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to apply to the the patient that's sitting in front of you. What I generally don't do is supplement exogenously progesterone in the postpartum period, although I do know a number of clinicians who do so. But when we're talking about making the right decision for a patient, their personal history with hormones in the past is something that I find the most useful because a number of women who've previously, for example, felt better on contraceptives that have a hormonal component suggests that their hormone vulnerability is such that they would benefit from taking postpartum progesterone, whether it's the mini pill or a hormonal IUD. And then I have other patients where it's the opposite. And so we tend to avoid those kinds of interventions. And we think about contraception in other ways, such as a copper IUD. So my point being that thinking about progesterone, postpartum, and mood at this point is still something that's complex, and we don't actually have enough data to make recommendations definitively across the board. It's a very individualized approach. And so these are just some resources that I offer a number of my patients or turn to myself. I really like the womensmentalhealth.org website. If you guys aren't familiar with that, I encourage you to take a look. Um, I also, I have a podcast on these topics and a blog uh, for reproductive safety data of medications. I like mother to baby. And then for resources for patients, I really like Postpartum Support International. They have a lot of resources online. They do a lot of groups around the country and around the world on all kinds of different topics, not just postpartum, also perinatal, infertility, a lot of different things that, that we're talking about today. So that's a really good resource as well.
So that's what I wanted to share with you is this uh, approach of integrative psychiatry in perinatal mental health, sharing just a few key examples from all of the different modules so you can get a feel and a flavor for how to use integrative treatments in a well-rounded approach to your perinatal patients. And I'm happy to answer any questions. I think we have about 10 minutes for that. Thank you, Anna, so much for, for making time to share about this. And I, I did appreciate that it was um, not just doing um, kind of regular reproductive psychiatry, looking at our usual um, psychopharmacological tools. So I appreciated, um, yeah, hearing, hearing kind of um, this more holistic perspective and really kind of thinking outside the box. Um, and as someone who does reproductive psychiatry, um, it was it was a good reminder for me because there are so many patients who are really desperately struggling and absolutely terrified of um, medications, despite whatever reassurance <laughs> provided. Um, so yeah, I'm really excited to open it up um, to see if anyone has questions for Dr. Glazer. Um, I have a question, uh, Anna. Hi, Dominic. Um, just regarding, if you could comment on. Uh, you know, in patients' uh, use of alcohol, cannabis products, other things, and how, you know, you engage with that aspect of, of their life and lifestyle. Yeah. So I think that, I mean, I think that's, it's really a ripe time for engagement around those topics. I mean, we know that, for example, certain levels of alcohol use actually impact fertility, so it can impact their ability to conceive in the first place. And so when they're coming to see you, perhaps after they're all already pregnant, again, if they're using certain amounts of alcohol or cannabis, using some of the, the methods that we already use uh, as mental health clinicians, um, motivational interviewing, um, psychoeducation, to, to let patients know about the detrimental effects, certainly that we know about alcohol, um, fetal alcohol syndrome, but there's, you know, more emerging data on cannabis. And um, it's, uh, this is a really interesting topic that we're getting more and more data on. A lot of it's coming out of Colorado, um, you know, as, as the data is, is catching up with use. And at this point, you know, the best that we can say is that we can't actually encourage people to continue to use cannabis, even if they're using it for certain kinds of mental health conditions, like it helps me with, um, with my anxiety or it helps me get to sleep because part of the issue is that cannabis is not regulated at all. It's really hard to know how much of a dose of THC or CBD you're getting with any particular cannabis product. And that's, you know, that's one of the, or how clean that product is. And that's a significant issue with being able to recommend these things. Instead, what I explain is that, you know, if we're trying to, if you're taking this for, let's say anxiety, well, here's seven other treatment options that we have for anxiety that we have a little bit more data on than the cannabis that you're currently using. How would you like to maybe try some of them in order to reduce the exposure to the cannabis for, for the fetus? So that's usually how I approach that. Um, so the, the data that we have at this point is not compatible with continuing cannabis in the context of pregnancy. We don't currently have, the other question I often get is specifically, well, what about just CBD? Because a lot of patients just take you know, CBD or CBN for anxiety. And at this point, I can't even point to one study that's trying to answer that question. Hopefully we'll have that. Um, but at this point, you know, cannabis is looked at as you know, a little bit more broadly um, as opposed to that specific subcomponent. Um, related to that, um... I found that patients who have been using cannabis um, really struggle to cut down or not use it. Um, oftentimes, because they're, um, they're, the overlap between nausea um, <laughs> is so challenging, um, and they kind of get stuck in the cycle. I'm just curious if there's any of these kind of alternative approaches that you found that have been helpful for. Yeah, so I think, I mean, the challenge with cannabis is both in terms of nausea and anxiety, there's, there can be a rebound effect. I mean, we certainly know um, about, you know, some of the significant, especially when you're using certain amounts of cannabis, um, you can have that rebound effect where you, you have hyperemesis or you have rebound anxiety. Um, and yes, you know, I, I know that cannabis in general tends to be used for for managing symptoms of nausea, 
but we do have a number of other options for managing nausea in the context of pregnancy, both prescription and non-prescription. Um, you know, B6 is a common one. Um, Unisom is a common one. Prescription options. I mean, there is a lot of my patients do take prescription medications like Dancitron in the context of pregnancy to help manage those symptoms. I think part of it is, you know, not necessarily stopping even the cannabis cold turkey, but you know, tapering off to decrease that that chance of rebound effect um, from, from too rapid of a discontinuation because it's a biological substance like any other. Hi, Dr. Glazer, I have a question. Um, this has been really helpful. <clears throat> Excuse me, this question is about scope. I'm a licensed social worker. And so I'm curious, all of these things, right? They're non-psychotropic meds, which are outside of my scope. I guess my question is, how would you consider what is your feedback about how to bring this up? Should I even be bringing this up? Should I consult with the doctor first if, you know, it could be helpful? Yeah. Yes, yeah, so I think that depends a little bit on, um, you know, your training and comfort in those particular treatment modalities. So for example, um, you know, in, in my um, fellowship program, I have, you know, the vast majority are um, prescribing clinicians, so, you know, midwives and, and MDs and, and nurse practitioners, but I also have some licensed social workers and psychologists. And part of that is, you know, it can be really helpful to know the data behind some of these kinds of interventions, um, whether we're talking about, you know, light boxes or, um, you know, nutritional approaches or, you know, mindfulness. I, I think if you are comfortable and familiar with the data behind these recommendations, I don't think you necessarily need to have a prescribing license to make those recommendations. That's helpful. I feel comfortable with like melatonin, the light box, but thinking about the magnesium. Um, okay, that's good feedback. Thank you. Yeah. That's a question. I don't know if you can see me. I'm, here we go. Um, so I am wondering if you could speak at all to the impact of, you know, in recent years, the pandemic and what we're seeing in terms of numbers for, um, you know, new mothers about postpartum mental health issues. And also, um, you know, what, I mean, so myself having been a first time mother during the pandemic, um, and, you know, having transitioned to, for the most part, working remotely, um, there kind of is no supplement for the quality of interaction that one has in, in person. And a lot did transition to be online for mothers during this time. Um, and yet it still feels like, mm, that link isn't really complete. Yeah, I completely agree with you. And I think um, I've worked with a lot of women who were going through number one, fertility challenges in the pandemic and all of their, you know, fertility treatments were canceled for, for a temporary period of time, um, who were pregnant during the pan during certainly the early stages of the pandemic. And so then they had to change so much of their plan in terms of you know, who's going to be even in the delivery room. Um, you know, could I even have my doula there? Like so many of these different things. And then all of the connections and, and the social, you know, uh, support systems. And so I think it's really impacted that, that piece of social support that I've, you know, sort of been emphasizing throughout this time, because it's it's really decreased. Uh, you know, I have a number of patients who've had um, some significant challenges connecting because they also, you know, continue to not feel safe. I, I think this is something that happened that I noticed quite a bit of, I want to say, um, you know, maybe towards the second half of last year, where a number of folks who were outside of the perivatal world were kind of out and about and back, back in the world, so to speak. But a lot of patients who are pregnant or postpartum with infants no, did not feel comfortable doing that, understandably, yet. And so they sort of felt, um, you know, similar to the patients with autoimmune conditions and things like that, like left out from this return, so to speak, into the world because they were feeling more vulnerable. And so, you know, again, not necessarily having that social connection. So to answer your, your, the first part of your question, I also definitely saw a significant uptick in perinatal and postpartum mental health conditions, usually PMADs, um, anxiety and, and depression and, and mood disorders. Um, and I think, you know, uh, 
I'm a lot of my patients now are you know, starting to make those connections again, you know, go to playgrounds and, and those kinds of things, um, you know, go to support groups, but it's still, you know, just kind of gingerly dipping, dipping toes in. And a lot of the programs aren't, you know, running anymore in a in-person sort of way. And, and so there's still some isolation and some limitations. So I agree with you. It's definitely done a number on, on our patient population. I think we're at time. So um, we're going to go ahead and wrap up. So I just want to say thank you so much um, again, uh, Anna, for being here with us. Um, and um, I've seen your website. There's lots of information. Um, so again, um, it's www.annaglazermd.com, right? That's right. Great. Yeah. Um, so yeah, thank you again so much for, for coming. Um, and thank you everyone for attending and for your great question. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Good to see you.